Ok, bueno. <coughs> eh, good morning, everyone. Eh, we're going to start talking about the interesting cases of the third year uh, residents at the Rheology Department on the Hospital Universitario Monterrey. My name is Dr. Claudio Alberto Casas. Uh, this time I'm going to try to give a different kind of case. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to drive this this case with some of the the tests were, that were taken and we're going to have the discussion right away. And we're going to start with this case in a patient that had abdominal pain in the dyspnea. This was a 40-year-old male with fever and abdominal pain for seven days. He treated himself with local uh, analgesics and, and some systemic analgesics for these seven days. He had a dyspnea that started for one day in the right thoracic pain. As well, when the physical test was, was, was taken, he said he had some inguinal and testicular discomfort. In his labs, he had leukocytosis uh, with neutrophilia. So. The surgery department uh, requested an abdominal ultrasound, but before meeting this study, the team made the right decision to evaluate the patient with what he already had. And it was interesting to see his chest x-ray where uh, an airfluid level appeared in the right hemithorax, as you can see here. And, and this airfluid level also was associated with this consolidation with was, uh, that was lobulated and this gave us some first differential diagnosis, which was an empyema or a lung abscess. So right we, we, we requested a, a thorax CT and it was taken. Because of a recent renal failure, the CT had to be made without contrast. But this didn't obscure our diagnosis since it was clearly an empyema with a nerve root level and, and well, an infection indeed. As you can see here, there's the airfield level, and we have some thickening of the, pl uh, um, uh, of the parietal and bis uh, uh, pleura. As well, the, the, it looks lobulated, so it's an, it's an empyema with, uh, with an airfield level in, in, the, in the place uh, here in the, in the, in the base of the, of the right lung. So um, it came to our attention that when the patient was taken to the CT, the abdomen was superficially distended, and when you touched it, there was some crackling. And because of the crackling, we decided, uh, we told the technician to do an abdominal CT as well at the same time. And this was the interesting thing. Like we look at that, it's like a lot of gas on the on the on the walls of the of the abdomen. And there, so there was a subcutaneous emphysema on the abdomen and the abdominal wall. Imagine if, if we try to do an ultrasound with all this amount of gas. So our, inix, our initial diagnosis uh, had to be changed and we urgently needed to determine which was the source of this. So pay attention to these parts specifically. As you can see there's a part where there's fat stranding and there's a, a tubular uh, appendix and it's, it, looks, um, it looks swollen. So we first thought, uh, so we started, uh, we started looking at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the abdomen CT and we, look, uh, and we uh, saw the appendicolite and the fat stranding. Typical, we all know that diagnosis, right? It's an, a, a, an acute appendicitis. But, and it was perforated, but how come this acute appendicitis was perforated and it didn't show intra-abdominal gas, intraperitoneal gas. And it was perforated because it was uh, perforating to the retroperitoneal space. So we had to make sense on this. We had to decide how this appendicitis, or what this seems to be an appendicitis, made uh, how this uh, is related to the empyema. So we have two things right now. We have an abdominal wall infection and acute appendicitis and empyema. So to make sense of this, we, we started to look at the study and we make some coronal reformatting and we understood the, the position and the location of the appendix. As you can see here, um, we have to remember that the location of the appendix in the peritoneal cavity depends on its length and its relationship to the cecum. Very old, very old, like 1974 bibliography. It's very old bibliography, but it's still valuable and it's still, uh, and still um, uh, approved. 
reminded us that the appendix could be in different positions in the abdomen. This you know it as well. And the most common position is to be retrocecal, which is the case. But we have to remember as well that the appendix can be intra or extra peritoneal. In this case, it was an intraperitoneal appendix with a retrocecal configuration that was pretty close to the place where the, la the right la lateral conal fascia and the gerota fascia met. So we were talking about this type of appendix. Why is this important? Because the gerota and the lateral conal fascia uh, get in, 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 the, in, our, in our actual CT show that this is a place where they meet and this is where the appendix perforated itself. And this is important because this made the appendix open to the parietal peritoneum and the fascias that were uh, that, that are adjacent to it, causing an infection to the posterior perirenal space. As you can see here, the posterior perirenal space is is filled of uh, of the of the infection that the appendix made, and we see, uh, we can see we can uh, there's see, we can see some gas. We can see gas. <laughs> we can see some gas. Um, <laughs> it's important to remember that the retroperitoneal space extends laterally, even to the front, to the properitoneal fat. This fatty tissue is the fatty tissue that stands, it's like the fatty tissue over here, and this is still part of the retroperitoneal space. And this is, this is some fatty tissue that stands between the parietal peritoneum and the transversalis fascia. So we have. We have to go in order here. We have the appendicitis. We have uh, the um, the infection going to the retro uh, peritoneal space and going to the properitoneal space. We, so we, we, we now uh, start uh, looking and making sense on how the infection is spreading through the abdomen. And superior to the retro uh, uh, space, uh, uh, to this posterior parietal space, it continues to the subdiaphragmatic extraperitoneal fatty tissue. And this is important because this is the way that it extended to the right impima. Uh, this, is a, this is a diagram for you to, to, to remember a little bit of the, of the anatomy of the, of the retroperitoneum. And the infection, here's the retroperitoneal space and the infection, the infection started over here spread to the anterior space and went as well to the upper space to the subdiaphragmatic space and making the and formatting this CT we saw how uh, we have to com we have to compare this uh, sagittal CT with this um, with this diagram uh, and what I want you to look here is how the this the infection of our patient here's the the, the, the appendicitis it opened to the retro peritoneal, uh, peritoneal space the the um, retrorenal space and went through the um, posterior renal space to the subdiaphragmatic space. Here's the, the, the continuation of the impima. And this is very interesting because everything started to make sense for us. The retrocrural space, which is this space over here, connects the thoracic cavity with the retroperitoneum. In fact, this fact in association with the different pressures that the thoracic uh, the thorax in the abdomen have, as well as the lymph uh, flow direction of these different uh, places, uh, explains the development of impiemas when, uh, uh, when they're followed by abdominal infections. So comparing this sagittal, sagittal CT, as I told you, you can, show, you can see that how the, this infection went to the impiema and made the thoracic infection. The, uh, it opened through the diaphragm through the parietal pleura and an infection located itself in the in the in the um, in the pleural space making the abscess that now we look here so we have one of the causes uh, we have we have two things two different things and how the appendix made this the the cryptopensitis made this infection but we have to understand some other things and is that and the infection also extended inferiorly. And for this part of the exposition I'm making of the case, we have to remember there's a new concept on the interfacial planes. This concept is actually uh, is relatively new. It's about like, uh, it's in the, 
it, it was stated like in the in the uh, 2002 and this concept says that um, uh, this is a the good thing of this concept is that first is a uh, widely accepted and it's a right logical concept is made from us and this concept explains how the pathologies extend through the retroperitoneum and this concept considers the fascias as potential spaces of spreading diseases through the retroperitoneum so the per the perirenal space here is close below here and in this and this pink area is called the combined interfacial plane is the combined plane where the retromesenteric plane, which is, this is the retromesenteric plane, or we can say it is the anterior renal fascia, and the retrorenal plane, or we can say it is the posterior renal fascia, continues to the pelvis. And this is important because this combined, combined interfacial plane is where, is how the diseases of the retroperitoneum spread to the pelvis. So, the plane itself continues to the pelvis and communicates with the retroperitoneal pelvic space. There are other there are the theories, like in the other chart, that and this is a theory of the uh, uh, 2016 theory from some Japanese researchers researchers that say that the um, retrorenal uh, plane, which is uh, here, colored in in in, in purple, uh, lies uh, just immediately adjacent to the psoas muscle and the, and the quadratus uh, lumbar muscle and the inner border of the perirenal space which is this gray area is limited over here so this theory indicates that the perirenal space ends here and this is the plane this is a plane import, important plane because it extends to a new plane called the subfacial plane. This is a plane just below the transversalis fascia. It, this is plane is important because this plane is, uh, could be explaining how the infection is going to the abdominal wall instead of going to the abdominal cavity, the, the peritoneal cavity. Still, this uh, this subfacial plane is still uh, need to be proven. Although this uh, these theories uh, are being used right now to explain how these diseases work and if we have to talk about the pelvic retroperitoneum we just have to remember that it's divided in three places in the prevesical space the paravesical perivesical space and the perirectal or sacral space which is over here the combined interfacial plane can send any disease to any of that pelvic part so in our case, the infection was taken to the prevesical plane. The prevesical plane is also known as the red seal space. And so the inferior per uh, uh, um, inferiority as well extended to the prevesical space, which is, uh, as I told you, part of the retroperitoneum and uh, uh, of the extraperitoneum of the pelvis, of the pelvic or retroperitoneum, and also uh, in this red space. space. Uh, in the diagram here, I'm explaining how this red space place is as, uh, is as well um, considered part of the extraperitoneal layers and not the peritoneal cavity. As you can see here, how the folds of the peritoneal cavity only go to here. So our infection started, we went up and it went went down as well, it went to a red seal space, and through this red seal space, like you can see here in a, in a sidal formatin, how the infection propagated to this, to this place, just to the uh, prevesical space, to the red seal space, and through this space, it went contralaterally. That's why we have another infection to the other part of the abdominal wall, and it is extending through the pelvic retroperitoneum space. So we have now a complex, um, a complex or a very complicated appendicitis that had an infection that went to the, to, the, to the thorax and went to the pelvic space without going to the peritoneum. And this is important because through, uh, through the other part of the, of the, of the um, through the contralateral part, it infected the abdominal wall and it came to our attention that, that through the left abdominal wall, 
the internal oblique muscle, here it's, the, it's, it's our same patient, the internal oblique muscle seemed to be affected and we saw some edema and some fat stranding extending to its anatomical son. What's the anatomical son of the internal oblique muscle? Decremaster, right? So this is, this is uh, the, the, um, and, and, uh, and the uh, a depiction of the of the of how the, anato the this anatomical detail helps to see how the infection was sent to the cremasteric muscle. So an infection sent to the cremasteric muscle created this. Anyone know what this is called? A Fournier gangrene. It's a typical necrocyting fasciitis in gangrene affecting the sternal genitalia or perine, and is characterized by facial thickening, as you can see here, and gas and fat stranding in the um, pelvic area. So we had a Fournier gangrene. So this case, we thought it was really interesting because um, it's very, it's very useful to describe the way the diseases flow through the retroperitoneum, but despite this detailed description, the surgical department wanted to establish other possibilities, and they thought that they believed that the empyema was the first pathology in the p that the patient had, and so, and they thought that empyema infected the retroperitoneum and then the appendix. Besides that being extremely unlikely, we decided. We decided the pathology department to give the last word to untie this situation we had here, and these were the results. We had some E. coli and some Enterococcus faecalis uh, bacteria on the on the thoracic wall. So, uh, how, how does the does this, uh, uh, abdominal bacteria went to the thoracic wall? Well, <laughs> uh, I just explained it to them, but they were they were a little they were a little not not that. Not impressed. <laughs> Not impressed. And the pathological um, conclusion was that the, it was there was some chronic and some acute infection to the to the appendix. So uh, we also noted that the this type of this type of complication that can pass in in in, uh, in appendicitis in acute appendicitis, uh, uh, perforating to the retroperitoneal space, isn't that clinically hurtful. So that's why the patient actually had an, a, a chronic, a chronic infection going through it because uh, he had no, no, uh, he didn't have that uh, that much of clinical signs or symptoms, and that's why he came to the to the, to the emergency department until not until seven days after he started this 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 infection. Uh, he well was uh, he. His, his left testicle was taken because it was all infected at the time of the surgery, and and it also said it was um, it was uh, with edema, vascular congestion, and 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 well infected. <laughs> and another thing, because uh, another important thing to see is that the blood cultures were totally negative, and this is important as well because there's some bibliography that states that the way the empyema can develop after acute appendicitis is through the bloodstream. It's a, 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 an hematogenal infection, but in this time we didn't have bacteria in the bloodstream. Oh well, that's what our blood culture said. So this is like the conclusion of the case. We have a retroperitoneal extension, an acute slash chronic appendicitis, with extraperitoneal infection that developed a right in plema and a four years of gangrene. So that's uh, about it. I made a, a, a complete uh, uh, search research for uh, to, to to look for this. For how this how is this case so so difficult? If, uh, if this case if this is a common case happening throughout the world and, and actually just came with three cases with empyema, two cases of abdominal wall infection, one case of a Fournier Grand Green after an appendicitis, but the appendicitis was a Neymar appendicitis, so it was, it was uh, herniated through the, through, the, through the testicle, so well, it's kind of uh, an obvious thing that will happen if that it's, that's, that's the case. And there was no clinical report of this, uh, with all these three things, so, and, and, uh, and I thought it was really important because of uh, this way we could um, we could have uh, we could read some of uh, some of the new theories of the retroperitoneal uh, dissemination of the pathologies so that's about it okay
Thank you. Ouais. Good morning, I'm Dr. Minerva Carolina Uribe, and today I want to present you my radiological case. First of all, a little clinical history. We have a 55-year-old male patient that began his condition one year ago with partial seizure on the left side of the body, secondarily generalized, without treatment because he lost uh, his uh, health insurance. On November 3rd, on, on the last year, he presented a new crisis accompanied by headache, why, which is why he was referred to the emergency department of our hospital. He was questioned in the emergency department, and then uh, was, uh, he was assessed by the neurosurgery service, who assessed him in, in 15 points of the Glasgow Coma Scale, with three millimeters normal reactive pulpits, alteration of the seven left pair, left hemiparesis, uh, four uh, or five in the lobe, um, in the lower head scale, and increase of tendinous reflexes. So it is admitted for his study. An interrogation, uh, nothing relevant. His, uh, his birth place uh, was in San Luis Potosí, place of residence uh, here in Monterrey, Nuevo León. His religion is Catholic, uh, civil status, married, employment, is, he is a security guard. Laterality, he dextrous, he dextrous, and uh, his uh, the familiar background denied. Pathological personal history was denied. And non pathological personal history, he only referred to social alcoholism. Allergies denied. And uh, we, este, we are going to see his imaging studies. <laughs> his first study was performed on November 3rd in, in the last year. And we began with a simple skull tomography. In this slide, we can demonstrate a decrease of the amplitude of the subarachnoid space. which corresponds to edema. I know it is not the right window, uh, but however, we can observe bone erosions in the anterior and middle cranial fossa. We continue to observe uh, vasogenic edema, and edema exerts mass effects and condition a deviation of the midline um, and compress the right lateral ventricle, and we can observe a hyperdense and serpiginous structure. We keep seeing the serpentine structure is hyperdense. And in, in these slides, in the right presenting region, we can identify a rounded and heterogeneous image, uh, which is solid with uh, kistic areas inside, which is associated with perilational edema and uh, that condition uh, uh, and diverse the midline to the left. We can observe the kistic areas inside the lesion. And in this uh, bone window, in these slides, uh, we can see the bone erosions on the anterior and, and uh, middle cranial fossa, which are bilateral and symmetric. Is that the bone erosion? Well, um, we, uh, contrast magnetic resonance was performed for a greater characterization of the lesion on November 11th. In this sequence, T1, without contrast, we can observe decrease in the amplitude of the subarachnoid space uh, that we already seen in the, in the CT, uh, which corresponds to edema with deviation and compression of the ventricular system. We corroborate the kistic image visualizing the tomography. And we observe hyperintense serpiginous image that possibly correspond to vascular structures and the edema that causes deviation of, uh, of the, from the midline and ventricular compression. We observe the heterogeneous lesion with solid and kistic component at the level of the right frontal lobe. We show um, an ex uh, extracranial extension and we, which corroborate uh, is an extraaxial origin. 
In this Tito sequence, we observe kistic areas and void flows that correspond with vascular structures. The edema exerts mass effect conditioning deviation of the midline of the left uh, to the left and compression of the ventricular system. We can observe the solid component of the mass and we can see um, that it's so intense to the gray matter. And in this slide, uh, the mass is, uh, we can observe the mass is also hyper intense in T2 with areas of necrosis in its interior. This is a flare sequence. We corroborate the edema that we already seen. And we see the, the, we see the vasogenic edema and the serpingenous structures. The mass is hyper intense in flare. And the mass presents areas of restriction to the diffusion sequence. Uh, in the Swan sequence, no bleeding areas are observed uh, in either calcifications. In the contra sequence, we, cor we corroborate the vascular origin of the void flows. The mask has a great enhancement of its solid component. However, the enhancement is heterogeneous secondary to the kistic and necrosis areas. Our differential diagnosis, well, uh, we, um, we think this is an hemangioparasitoma. Uh, this is a, a, for what can occur in any region of the body where there are capillaries. It's, it's a highly cellular and vascularized mesenchymal tumor, nearly always attached to the dura. It's a neoplastic transformation of the parasite. And the clinical presentation is usually due to mass effect and will vary depending on location. We can have headaches, seizures, focal, neuro focal neurological dysfunction, maybe all present, uh, be all presenting features. Additionally, in up to 20% of cases, these tumors can metastasize systematically, typically to liver, lung, and bone. Well, his epidemiology, um, uh, Mangioparasectomas account for less than 1% of all intracranial tumors. They are typically encountered in younger adults uh, to 30 to 50 years old, with up to 10% being diagnosed in children. It's very rare. There is a slight male prediction, and in these slides we can see an actual T1 contrasted MRI that shows a large heterogeneous uh, enhancing mass attached to the false. We can, we can see that depend on the faults. And in the imaging, uh, can mimic the much more common atypical meningioma. Uh, however, hemangioparasitoma was diagnosed at surgical research in this patient. It's a who grade two or grade uh, three, uh, uh, can we, we call it anaplastic. And in this slide, we have an image, and it's a gross pathology cut section that shows a lobulated circumscribed vascular mass with multiple uh, enlarged vascular channels that are characteristic of an hemangioparasitoma. The imaging features, well, it's a lobular enhancing extraction mass with dural attachment and we can see it's called erosion. It's a supratentorial mass, typically involved valves, tentorium or dural sinuses, and it's a ter an heterogeneous enhancement. Uh, we can see a dural tail commonly seen. Uh, however, this is more common in uh, meningiomas, and the size is very variable. However, we can we can see that uh, the mass can uh, can, can be uh, greater than uh, four centimeters. In this uh, in this image, we can see a coronal T2 uh, MRI that shows a heterogeneous hyperintense mass in the um, and inferior frontal region with central flow voids, and we can see bone erosion characteristic of a mangioparasitoma. In a coronal uh, T1 uh, with contrast MRI, in the same patient shows a diffuse enhancement of the lobular mass and imaging mimics a meningioma. But, however, a CT can be helpful to further define bone erosion. Uh, like in this image, we have a contrast uh, CT, and a contrast enhancement CT that shows an aggressive appearance and lobular extraction mass with bone erosion. Central necrosis and surrounding edema is typical of an hemangioparasitoma. We can see in this MR, uh, contrast MRI that shows an ablation enhancing mass with areas of low signal intensity representing necrosis and extension through the calvaria. And in the CT, in a non enhanced CT, we can see an hyperdense extraction mass with surrounding edema. We have a low density kistic or necrotic areas are common, and a calvarian erosion we, uh, may be seen. 
Uh, it's very rare uh, that we can find a calcium or hyperostosis. It's very rare. This is more common of an meningioma. And contact enhancement, we can see a strong heterogeneous enhancement. Uh, we can, uh, we must consider uh, a mangioparasitoma when we have a, a lesion that mimics a meningioma that has a typical features like frank bone erosion and multiple bo uh, flow voids. In MRI, in T1, uh, we can uh, see an heterogeneous mass. It's in test gray matter with uh, flow voids maybe seen. And at T2 um, sequence, we have heterogeneous iso intense mass with prominent blow, uh, f flow voids are common with surrounding edema and mass effect typi is typical. In a contrast MRI, we have a marked enhancement, often heterogeneous, and a dura tail is seen in 15%, uh, 15% uh, with a central necrosis may be seen. Our differential diagnosis. Uh, well, well uh, the meningioma uh, is more common in patients uh, over 50 year old uh, with uh, smooth margins, uh, no bone erosion. It's more common in meningiomas that we can find, find hyperostosis and calcium is characteristic. Uh, multiple lesions can be seen in meningiomas and metastasis is less common. Uh, often calcified with broad dural base, uh, we can find dural tail. Maybe indistinguishable with meningioma. Uh, other diagnosis that we can, uh, we must, uh, we must uh, um, find is uh, with lymphoma. But lymphoma is more common than it's a multiple lesions and is very rare that cause uh, on erosions. Uh, it's all on my part. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Edgar Hernandez, and today uh, my case review is about a 17-year-old female patient with history of dysphagia. Uh, no relevant pathological history uh, about the patient. Uh, however, uh, a few days before uh, coming to ho our hospital, she had an upper gastrointestinal series reporting an uh, external compression of the stomach. So uh, the, uh, her physician uh, asked about or told her to perform a CT of her abdomen. So we have the, the images of the contrast in haste uh, CT. Uh, we see the liver with no apparent, uh, apparent lesions. We see the, the spleen, pancreas, and we, we cut off our outation, the, the stomach and the pancreas. In between them, we see a mass, heterogenic mass, and in the lower image, we see that that mass corresponds to a small bowel between the pancreas and the stomach. In the sagittal view, we can corroborate that the, the stomach over here and over here, we see the, the renal, uh, the left renal, the left kidney, and we see the the small bowel going between the kidney, between the the pancreas, and between the, the stomach. We see, and over here in a more lateral view, the same image. So we have a, a patient with dysphagia that has a In this oblique image, we can see how the, the small vowel goes between the, 
the stomach and the pancreas and, and, and stays in that location. Also, as a other feature, we can see that she has uh, both kidneys, um, horseshoe kidney, thanks. And so with this image and this image, we, can, uh, we came to the conclusion that this is a case of an internal hernia of a small bowel. Uh, the internal hernia is a protrusion of abdominal viscera through the opening of uh, within a confines of peritoneal cavity. In this image, we can see something uh, really close to that with a patient with a small bowel going through a loop and a defect of the peritoneum. Internal hernias are classically reported uh, to cause approximately 4% of the causes of small bowel obstruction, in acute small bowel obstruction. Um, the, the orifice of the internal hernias can be congenital or acquired mostly after uh, surgery. The clinical, uh, clinically, the, the internal hernias can be asymptomatic or cause significant discomfort after the patient eats, uh, ranging from constant like epigastric pain or intermittent claw clip per, uh, per umbilical pain. Also, the, the most common clinical feature about this are that the patients have uh, dysphagia or abdominal pain uh, after sh uh, they eat. So abdominal symptoms include nausea, vomiting, or recurrent intestinal obstruction. Uh, but most of the times, these are asymptomatic. Uh, sometimes in, uh, the symptoms uh, can range very widely about uh, the severity. They uh, have a duration that is very different, or they, they, they can be really really, really intense pains de pain dependent on if the bowel is suffering or not. So the most common type of, type of internal hernia are the paradoidal hernia. And the most common type of the paradoidal hernia are the left paradoidal hernia. Uh, the paradoidal hernias are the most uh, uh, accounting for the approximately 53% of all the cases, and of these, 75% are left paradoidal hernias. Uh, the, the hernia or the small bowel goes through the fossa or lancer, uh, and it takes it, its position between the stomach and the pancreas. Also, we can have uh, another anatomical reference uh, using the ascending uh, left colic artery. Also, we can, uh, the fossa of a layer and is uh, part of the, of the right paradoidal hernias. Uh, curiously, the left paradoidal hernia has a sex pre predilection being more common in men having a ratio of three to one uh, men and female. The left paradoidal hernia uh, accounts for 40% of the internal hernias, and the small vowel herniates through the fossa of Lancer, and most of the time this is a, con a congenital failure of fusion of the descending colon and mesentery to the peritoneum. Uh, at the left quadrant, and the most common uh, clinical features are uh, pain, <laughs> abdominal pain. Uh, so in, this is an example of a uh, actual non-enhanced CT demonstrating a cluster of uh, encapsulated small bowel on the left abdomen. Uh, we can see that the loops is behind the stomach adjacent to the distal duodenum, just like our, our patient. And the, the colon is, keep, uh, is 
posterior to the stomach and the colon, keeping uh, with a parodontal hernia. We can see also this example of a contrast enhanced uh, CT with the same, a cluster of, of small vowels behind the stomach and the colon and pancreas. So this is really similar to our patient uh, having a paralonal hernia. Thank you very much. I have a, I have a question. I'd like to know if, if there's any association with the horseshoe kidney and the internal no, hernias. No, not really, no, not. Uh, it's really difficult uh, to associate both of them. Uh, there is no, uh, I didn't find anything that related uh, defects on the peritoneum and the horseshoe kidney. There's predisposition of uh, malrotation and the uh, association with the horseshoe, horseshoe kidney and where there, when there is malrotation uh, there, there's more predisposition to the uh, internal hernias uh, of the uh, which kind was I, I don't remember which kind but uh, it's associated <laughs> Good morning, uh, my name is Jorge Vélez, uh, and I'm going to give an interesting case. Uh, this was a 43-year-old female with chronic renal fa failure and uh, three renal transplants. And she began seven days ago with uh, dull left knee pain and progressive swelling. Uh, um, AP and lateral radiographs were taken of the left knee, uh, which shows the AP shows uh, degenerative changes like joint space narrowing with predominance of the um, medial compartment. Uh, there's lateral compartment and uh, we also can see um, uh, osteophytes, uh, marginal osteophytes, lateral and posterior uh, osteophytes. Uh, also we can see uh, subchondral uh, femoral cysts uh, and some varus, no, it's valgus deformity of the uh, knee. Uh, and all these findings are consistent with osteoarthritis. Uh, but the finding that um, called our attention the most was this inhomogeneous uh, area of sclerosis in the metadiaphysis. Uh, which we could describe, describe as patchy or diffuse uh, with serpinginous uh, pattern of sclerotic borders. Uh, it, the, uh, an MR was taken and in the T1 and the proton density uh, showed the uh, marginal osteophytes on the femoral condyles and the, uh, on the tibia. 
as well we can see in the proton density the uh, subchondral cysts and the um, the joint effusion uh, some cartilage loss uh, all these uh, were, were consistent with osteoarthritis uh, as well we can see the uh, the image that caught our, our attention in the radio radiograph uh, we can see it as uh, low signal serpiginous pattern uh, which is a, no, I'm not going <laughs> to give the diagnosis yet, uh, with internal signal on, on the T1, internal low signal on the T1, and uh, high uh, heterogeneous signal on the proton density, which is a, a fluid sensitive sequence. Uh, we can also see uh, the double line sign on the uh, proton density sequence, that it's characterized by an outer low signal rim and an inner margin of high signal, which is uh, the serpiginous demarcation between the uh, living bone and the necrotic uh, bone. On the sagittal T1 and proton density, uh, we can see the uh, serpiginous pattern of the uh, metadiaphyseal lesion, as well as the effusion that looks uh, bright on, on the proton density and low signal on the T1 on the supra, in the suprapatellar recess. Uh, axial T1 and proton density sequences, uh, the level of the uh, distal femur of the same, uh, shows the same uh, serpiginous lesion as well as the joint effusion. Okay, this was a, a bone infert. Uh, a bone infarct is defined as the death of the bone and marrow secondary to loss of blood supply. Uh, it is also known as osteonecrosis, a vascular necrosis, and a septic necrosis. These terms may be used interchangeably, uh, but by convention, the term bone infarct is used when the lesion is not in a subchondral location. Uh, many patients have no predisposing factors and infarcts May, may be considered idiopathic. Mm, it might be uh, predisposing the sickle cell disease and uh, stero steroid use, which was the case of our patient because she was a, a kidney transplant patient. Uh, she has to be on, on uh, prednisone. And the uh, findings on the X-ray on the X-ray are classic. Um, but the MR is usually the definitive, which gives us the definitive diagnosis. Um, it can mimic uh, other disease frequently, uh, and but the MR gives us the uh, differences. The etiology um, is the diminished blood flow to the bone, which can be by an embolic phenomenon, which is the sickle cell disease, or the uh, lipid emboli, uh, also an increased marrow pressure, which is given by the use of steroids of gaucher disease. The use of steroids was the case of our patient, and the uh, uh, diminished vessel size, which we can see on in vasculitis. Or many patients have no predisposing factors, so it could be considered idiopathic. Uh, the radiographic fi findings could be um, initially normal. It, they could be, uh, there could be a wide range of findings depending on the, on the stage of the infarct or the repairing process or the generation of the lesion. Uh, it can initially appear normal. It may develop a abnormal density with various patterns uh, such as patchy or diffuse sclerosis, which we could see on the uh, our patient radiograph or, or this one. Um, it could be also serpiginous dystrophic calcification, which we also saw on our, our patient and on this radiograph, which I will describe briefly. Uh, it may also rarely develop sarcomatous degeneration, uh, and we will uh, find on the x-rays change of character in the lesion um, from benign appearing, like this one, or the, our patient, to a highly aggressive lytic lesion with cortical breakthrough and soft tissue mass. It usually transforms to a malignant fibrous histiocytoma. 
Uh, on this lateral x-ray of the ankle um, shows the typical serpiginous pattern of the uh, dystrophic calcification on, of the bone infarct. In this case, it's in the calcaneus and the distal tibia. Uh, this is not the uh, punctuate calcification seen in an enchondroma, which is our, our main uh, differential diagnosis. Uh, and the multiplicity of the lesions also invokes the diagnosis of bone infarcts because uh, they, could, they could be multiple. Uh, on this AP X-ray, uh, we can see a serpiginous calcification in the metadiaphysis, which is typical of the uh, bone infarct. More distally, we can see a, high, a more aggressive lytic lesion that is extending from the uh, bone infarct, and this was proved to be a malignant fibrous histiocytoma from an, another uh, bone infarct, which is a complication as we saw previously. Uh, this letter of radiograph of the femur shows a metadiaphysal abnormality with, that includes a dense sclerosis, as well as punctuate calcifications. This is also a pattern that, that we can see, not, not only as a serpiginous um, calcification, but also as punctuate. Um, you could uh, consider as a differential diagnosis and enchondroma again. Uh, on the MR, uh, the findings that we're going to have um, are uh, the, the double, si double line sign on the uh, fluid sensitive sequences. In this case, this is a T2, where we can see the double line sign, which is a, a low signal rim with a high signal uh, internal rim following that the low signal. Uh, the in internal with, with a serpiginous pattern. The internal signal is variable depending on the, uh, on the stage of the, of the infarct. Um, the first phase uh, is usually fat. It will have the, the same uh, intensity of the bone marrow. Uh, and the second phase, phase, it could be an hemorrhage, hemorrhagic, um, hemorrhagic stage, and we are going to see that one as, as high signal on T1 and T2. Uh, there will be a next phase, which is an edema-like signal, which will be low on T1 and high on T2, which was the, the case of our patient. That was a, it had a low signal on T1 and a high in T2 sequences. Uh, also, we can see the dystrophic calcification, which is low signal on all sequences, as we can see here. Uh, it's in the T1, it's low signal, and it's low signal on the uh, T2 sequences or the fluid uh, sequences. The one we use here is the proton density, uh, and this forms the double ring sign. Uh, the cystic de degeneration is uncommon, and we are going to see it as low on T1 and high on T2 as cyst. And post contrast imaging uh, might show an enhancing rim surrounding the uh, low signal fluid of these cysts. Uh, the transformation to sarcoma, again, uh, we're going to see the change of character in the uh, lesion. It will show a cortical breakthrough with soft tissue mass or we are going to start seeing uh, the infarct uh, hyperintense and heterogeneous in T2. Our main differential diagnosis is the enchondroma, which is a benign tumor of hyaline cartilage originating in the medu medullary bone, lung bones. Uh, this will be a, a geographic cent central lesion. Um, with uh, or without chondroid matrix. On MR, on, MR, uh, on the fluid sensitive uh, sequences, we're going to see it as a lobula lobulated high signal, uh, w which is uh, typical of benign cartilage lesions or enchondromas. On this coronal steer, uh, we see uh, the lobulations with a low signal cartilage matrix, which is typical of an enchondroma. Uh, differ, uh, the difference is that this one's lobulated and the infarct is serpiginous. Uh, on this AP radiograph of the uh, knee, we can see the, the chondroid matrix of an enchondroma, 
with uh, they describe it as rings and arcs. We can see the protuberance and, and the convexities of the uh, of the of the lobulated pattern that this lesion has. Uh, the metaphysial location is typical for the diagnosis, and there is no um, aggressive characteristic to this lesion. We can see the uh, cortical is, is respected and its central location. Uh, the other uh, differential diagnosis is the non-ossifying fibroma. Uh, these are the most uh, common of non-neoplastic fibrous bone lesions. Uh, and these are a, a larger version of the uh, fibrous cortical defect. And these are, um, okay. these are typically uh, multiloculated uh, loosened lesions with, sclero with an scleroc sclerotic rim. They are located, this is the most important uh, thing, that they are located eccentrically in the metadive, in the metaphysis. Uh, and they will be adjacent or nearby the uh, feces, um, nearby to the feces. Uh, as the patient ages, it, it, it seems to migrate away from the physis. So, initially the lesion has high or intermediate T2 sign uh, with a peripheral low signal rim corresponding to the uh, sclerotic border. So this is what makes it uh, similar to the uh, bone infarct. Um, but as well, we the difference here is that this is an ex eccentric lesion, and it, it's not serpiginous. It, it is um, well circumscribed. And that will be it. Thank you.